Audrey Munson posed for hundreds of artists throughout her brief career, earning her nicknames like Miss Manhattan and the American Venus, along with a reputation as the most well-known muse of early 20th century America. But after an attempt at a film career fizzled out, Audrey struggled to reclaim her place among New York's artist elite. Even though her image lives on in sculptures and other works, her story is an often overlooked part of art history. Audrey is everywhere. She's an angel in the skyline, and she's lounging on the Upper West Side, and she's at the Brooklyn Museum, and she's in Cleveland and Wisconsin, even as a mass-produced statuette on a family mantle. An abstract Audrey is also suspended in pigment, in a painting by the French artist Bacabia. Inside a wrought iron fence that surrounds the Riverside Oval, a postage stamp-sized park near the western end of 156th Street, is a low granite octagon, maybe 20 feet across and a foot and a half high. The Oval Park in the center of Riverside Drive dates back to 1911, when the city finally opened the extended Riverside Drive north of Grant's tomb. This octagon enclosed a fountain, which was designed to feature a statue of a cherub and a mermaid, called Music of the Waters. The sculptor's model for the mermaid was Audrey Munson. A statue of her presides over Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts. She holds a Bible as Evangeline in the Longfellow Memorial in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She was even in mass circulation for decades as the model for the Walking Liberty Half Dollar. Just a few years after working with the great artists of that era, Audrey Munson disappeared from the New York art world, caught up in a murder scandal that would unfairly ruin her reputation. She paid a heavy price for being America's first supermodel. Audrey was born in Rochester, New York, on June 8, 1891. Her father, Edgar, worked as a trolley car conductor, with dreams of hitting it big in real estate. Her mother, Kitty Mahoney, was the daughter of Irish immigrants. She divorced Edgar when Audrey was eight. She had to, she said, because he was having an open affair with another woman whom he later married. After the divorce, Kitty and Audrey began a new life in Providence, Rhode Island. Kitty worked as a boarding house keeper, and Audrey eventually attended a Catholic high school called St. Francis Xavier Female Academy. It was there, under the tutelage of the Sisters of Mercy, that the young Audrey learned how to sing and play the piano, violin, harp, mandolin and guitar. Around this time, Florence Siegfeld Jr. was beginning to make waves with the Siegfeld Follies, 
a series of extravagant variety shows that often featured large choruses of attractive young women, who came to be known as the Ziegfeld Girls. Though Audrey never performed in one of the Ziegfeld's reviews, in hindsight her many charms would have made her a perfect Ziegfeld girl. She did though appear in the choruses of similar productions, including The Girl and the Wizard, Girlies and La Belle Paris. Imagine if Audrey had joined the Siegfeld Follies. It's entirely possible her name would have faded into anonymity with the hundreds of other Broadway hopefuls, whose careers fizzled out once they were past their prime. But a chance encounter in the street was to drastically change her life. Audrey claims her career began by accident. She was with her mother walking down Broadway Street in New York City when a man approached her. He asked her if she was a model and also if she would be willing to pose for photographic plates. That man was Felix Benedict Herzog. The money would come in very handy and the request seemed innocent and plausible. Mother and daughter duly showed up at his studio where he photographed Audrey scantily draped in gauzy fabric. Herzog introduced them next to Isadora Conti. Conti asked if Audrey would be willing to pose in the All Together for a large piece he was working on, destined for the grand ballroom in the Hotel Astor. Now, photographs in opaque costume were one thing, but full nudity was something else. They were both appalled by his request, but Conti assured them that, as an artist, his motivation was above reproach. To us it makes no difference if our model is draped or clothed in furs, he said. We only see the work we are doing. The Munsons ultimately agreed, mostly because they needed money, the sculpture was called Three Graces, and Audrey was all three. She later called that piece, which now exists only in photographs, a souvenir to my mother's consent. When Audrey was five years old, her mother took her to have her fortune told in East Syracuse, New York. Gypsy Queen Eliza gazed into her crystal ball and told her, You shall be beloved and famous, but when you think that happiness is yours, its Dead Sea fruit shall turn to ashes in your mouth, you who shall throw away thousands of dollars as a caprice, shall want for a penny, you who shall mock at love, shall seek love without finding. Seven men shall love you. Seven times you shall be led by the man who loves you to the steps of the altar. But never shall you wed. From that day on, she would consider the gypsy's words a curse.
James Bone, a former New York bureau chief for the Times of London, wrote a book about Audrey, titled The Curse of Beauty. Set like gemstones in her milky skin, she had questioning, slightly impertinent grey-blue eyes, he wrote. She had a voluptuous figure and had a talent for finding the perfect pose and holding it for hours. Audrey was no slacker. Success came from her relentless work ethic. She was known to wander into different studios asking for work. Audrey's success also came about due to the fact that she came extremely cheap, charging about 50 cents an hour, an amount that would equate to about $15 today, times 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. The job required statue-like stillness, the quality of appearing soft, while simultaneously contracting every muscle in the body. It is really a strain, Audrey once said. If a girl's nerves are not in excellent condition and her muscles are not strong and ready for such a test, she makes a wobbly sort of model, and the artist cannot work. Audrey quickly became one of New York's most prolific early models, posing for what she estimated was a total of 200 artists, including photographers, illustrators, painters, sculptors, and even a tapestry weaver. The Metropolitan Museum of Art houses 30 or so Audrey-inspired statues. The caryatids supporting the main saloon's mantelpiece in one of J.P. Morgan's yachts were carved from Audrey's likeness, and tapestries in George Vanderbilt's mansion were also designed in her image. Since some of the pieces Audrey modelled for were privately commissioned, it's not clear where they ended up, or if they've even survived various renovations and relocations. As for those still prominently displayed, perhaps the most striking piece is civic fame, a 25-foot gilded copper statue atop the Manhattan Municipal Building that Adolf Alexander Weinman designed in 1913. It's New York's second largest statue, dwarfed only by the Statue of Liberty herself. Another gilded version of Audrey decorates the top of the USS Maine National Monument in Columbus Circle honoring the 260 sailors who died during the 1898 sinking of the USS Maine in Havana, Cuba. This work was funded by William Randolph Hearst in 1913. The statue depicts Columbia, the female personification of the United States, riding a seashell chariot pulled by three-horse seahorse hybrid creatures called Hippocacampi. Sculptor Attilio Piccarilli used metal from the sunken ship for parts of the memorial, which also includes a ship's prow jutting over a fountain and a plaque that lists the victims' names. Audrey was the archetypal beauty of her time. When, in 1913, she was interviewed about her first posing session, she said, We did not like the idea at all, but finding out that he was one of the best photographers in town, my mother and I went. He took some photographs, said I had a head almost antique in line, and began to tell his artist friends about me. At the turn of the century, the movement returned to classical themes in art and architecture, like those of ancient Greece and Rome. America, 
flush with cash, sought to make New York City a global capital on par with the great cities of Europe, and so began pouring money into public monuments in an attempt to pack centuries of history into a handful of decades. Parallel to her meteoric rise was the emergence of eugenics, a long since discredited field of pseudoscience, concerned with the pursuit of genetic perfection. This influenced the artistic movement at the time in representing the ideal type of man and woman. Audrey became the ideal for the artists who portrayed her. They glossed over her individual features to turn her into a classical ideal that didn't exist in reality. Audrey developed an obsession with her own mathematical perfection. After all, so many had convinced her of this, whilst deftly removing her apparel. During her eventual slide into obscurity, she held a pageant seeking the most perfect man, specifying that he must be of English or Danish origin. Audrey had grown up valuing her English-American beauty above all else, and her idea that marriage should be for the good of the race reflected her eugenic, xenophobic and anti-Semitic tendencies. These sentiments would be revealed in a letter she once wrote to the US Department of State. But that was later. It was now the height of her fame, and Audrey had copious amounts of money and fame. Her father complained she spent money like water. In 1916, she moved to California to appear in the infant motion picture industry. For her very first film, Inspiration, Audrey had to drop her frock. It was considered the first non-pornographic film to feature a nude woman. Audrey's role is of a model and muse to a sculptor who falls in love with her, but not until after he's covered her naked body in plaster. Casting differences aside, a group of Baptists, Presbyterian and Catholics came together to rally against a local screening of Inspiration in New Rochelle, New York, on the basis that the film was morally corrupt and unsuitable for public consumption. A group of high school students who had gathered for the cancelled screening returned home crestfallen. She acted in three more films and then returned to the East Coast. She began dating rich men in New York and Newport, Rhode Island, including silver heir Herman Ulrichs Jr. He was at that time the richest bachelor in America. Her mother claimed the two had actually married, though there's no record to support this. Audrey would not be deterred by the moralists. She was never one to easily let go of an opportunity. She appeared nude again in 1916's Purity. It was another successful motion picture, but it also marked the beginning of the end of Audrey's rise to fame. Her next film, The Girl of Dreams, was never released. The reasons are unknown, but biographer James Bone has speculated it may have been a dispute over film rights. The relationship with Ulrichs Jr. turned sour by early January 1919. That same month, she sent a strange letter to the US Department of State, insisting that the German government's considerable investment in the film industry was preventing her from booking any roles. 
she listed her former beau and other well-known German Americans and German Jews as co-conspirators in this plot, arguing that they discriminated against her because she was descended from early British settlers. As you know, the Kaiser's 25 million in the motion picture industry has thrown me out of work as I am an American of English blood dating back to the Mayflower days, she wrote. With the 1920s swept in a demand for new styles, the demand for Audrey as a model started to fade. Newspaper articles appeared claiming she was cursed with misfortune. Still, many men, and not all of them artists, still found Audrey very desirable. There were tragic romances, marriage proposals from strangers, and the inevitable seduction attempts by errant artists and film producers. On one occasion, a powerful Broadway producer, whom she never named, entered her dressing room during the production of a play called The Fashion Show. He made sexual advances. Audrey firmly pushed him away, saying, Don't touch me. I hate you. Your touch is repulsive to me. I would rather have a snake crawl over me than to feel your hand upon me. This rebuff didn't go down well. A few days later, she received a telegram stating that the play was closing imminently. From then on, she struggled to find work. In 1919, Walter Wilkins, a 65-year-old physician and the owner of a house on West 65th Street, in which Audrey and her mother had recently been tenants, beat his wife to death with a machinist's hammer, possibly in the hope that Audrey would then be willing to marry him. This was despite the fact that that Audrey and Wilkins were never involved socially or romantically. He was sentenced to death, but hanged himself in his cell before he could be executed. This scandal pretty much ruined Audrey's career and reputation, and as a result, finding employment became almost impossible. In 1921, Audrey attempted to polish her tarnished reputation by telling her life story in 20 serialized articles. The Queen of the Artists' Studios was published in Hearst, New York, American newspaper. The series was meant to drum up publicity for her new film, Heedless Moths, also based on Audrey's life. But the filmmakers only used Audrey herself for a few publicity shots and gave the majority of her role to newcomer Jane Thomas. She wrote later in despondence, I am wondering if many of my readers have not stood before a masterpiece of a lovely sculpture or a remarkable painting of a young girl. Her very abandonment of draperies, accentuating rather than diminishing her modesty and purity, and asked themselves the question, Where is she now, this model who has been so beautiful? What has been her reward? Is she happy and prosperous? Or is she sad and forlorn? Her beauty gone, leaving only memories in its wake. With this sudden lack of fame, the invitations to social engagements and the admiration by the High Society of New York quickly trickled away. She had served their desire for the beautiful, the daring, the scandalous. 
but now Audrey was aging. In her early thirties, her body was not that of a young woman anymore. Money ran short for the Munson women soon after, and very little funds had been saved from the successful years. Audrey said in an interview that she never thought it possible for her career to end so suddenly. By 1922, a dispirited Audrey was living with her mother. In May of that year, at 31 years old, the former model tried to swallow mercury-based poison in a suicide attempt. She survived, but afterwards did not try to return to the limelight. Mother and daughter lived frugally in a small town in upstate New York. Her mother sold kitchenware door-to-door to support them. Audrey was regarded as an eccentric, often serving as the scapegoat when town folk needed someone to blame. Her mental health became very fragile. In 1931, at the age of 40, Audrey's mother had her committed to St. Lawrence State Hospital in Ogdensburg citing depression, delusion, and hallucinations. Officially, it stated she had an incurable mental blight. Except for a brief stint in a nursing home, she remained at that hospital for the next 65 years. And her mother's death in 1958 marked the beginning of a 26-year period when no one came to visit her. Documents revealed she had spent much time in the library, and caring for the many cats that lived on the grounds. Then, in 1984, Audrey's half-brother's daughter, Darlene Bradley, tracked her down and took her father to be reunited with his long-lost sister. Darlene continued to pay regular visits until her elderly aunt died on February 20, 1996, at 104 years old. Audrey was cremated and her ashes were placed in her father's grave at New Haven Cemetery in New York. An ironic end to the life of a woman immortalized all over the United States in stone and gold. The tombstone listed Edgar Munson, his second wife Cora and their daughter Vivian. But there was no mention of the former Miss Manhattan who had once taken America by storm. In 2016, New Haven town clerk Deborah Allen and town historian Marie Strong decided it was time to honor Audrey's legacy with a tombstone of her own. She not only stood up for her own rights, but also became an activist and organizer fighting for the recognition of other women, artist Andrea Geyer explains. For that and many other achievements, she deserves to be remembered by name. Audrey had exposed salary discrepancies between women and men, as well as between female actresses and artists' models, and alluded to the inherent sexism of the art world in the early 1900s. An archive shows that Audrey Munson gave $5, a day's salary back then, to the suffragette movement in 1917. The Riverside Oval Association held its biannual It's My Park Day in 2019. There used to be water in the park to feed the fountain, but the plumbing deteriorated decades ago. Bruce Robinson, a member of the association, said, We hook up a hose to a fire hydrant across the street, and while that works, it's less than ideal. The city has approved a plan to run new pipes 
but Robinson said, The money is still sitting in the parks department. Even once the water has been connected, there will be no mermaid, because at some point, the statue of Audrey mysteriously disappeared. First of all, my dear friends, Happy New Year! Happy 2022! Well, didn't 2021 go by very quickly? And thank goodness for that. Hopefully this year will be better. Fingers crossed! So what did you think about Audrey Munson? A bit of a whirlwind life, eh? From nothing to fame, back to nothing again. Just shows how fickle the public can be. It's interesting also the, uh, the ideal beauty back then. Uh, I wouldn't call Audrey really beautiful compared to the, say, the Ziegfeld girls. Uh, that he picked some very attractive women. She had a very large jaw, prominent nose. Um, it wouldn't be what we would call beautiful today, but she obviously had that figure and also that she could pose for long periods without moving a muscle, which must be incredibly difficult. That was obviously very desirable for the artists. Uh, but what a long life. What an amazingly long life. I'm not sure whether I'd want to live that long. Uh, I'll read to you soon about how she was in her final years in the nursing home. Quite quite adorable, actually. I, I, I find it quite heartening. I think you will agree once I read it to you. So this is a quote from Audrey after that murder case that she was unwillingly involved in. It had nothing to do with her, but she was dragged into this scandal. So she says, The Wilkins case ruined my career. I'll never account for anything again. From loving and admiring me, the public seems to have grown to hate me. I find it quite funny, well, not really funny, but peculiar that the people talk about the cancel culture today. But the cancel culture was alive and well back then too. They just didn't have the internet to spread the hate, but it was very much alive and well. The public were very fickle and always have been. Even back in the Roman times in the arena, uh, one day they could be lauding the gladiator and next day the thumbs were going down. He was uh, destined for lion food. Very interesting. Anyway, I will read that account about Audrey in her final years. It's really quite sweet. So this is from a website called www.can or can info. Uh, I think it might be a French website, but it details Audrey's life. So after Audrey's fame and fortune were over, they moved back north to Mexico, New York, which I guess is some little small town there, or was some small town at that time. You know, and she had lived an amazing life before that. So it must have been difficult for her to come to a small town, and even worse, to not be accepted by the small town folk. Uh, so it says here, Audrey was seen in unusual outfits, often wearing colourful scarves wrapped like a turban around her head. A woman I meet tells me she remembers as a little girl her mother would storm to the sun parlour and close the curtains when Audrey, who had undressed for money, passed by. People did not care for her fame, her life in the city, her travel, her stories. Mexico, after all, was a small town, a tight community of proper people, in which an independent creative woman like Audrey had no ground on which to be accepted. She was considered improper, and soon thereafter, playing crazy. So, very sad actually. Obviously, that would depress the most sane person, and uh, the person who wrote this article 
thinks that Audrey may have been depressed and resorted to drugs to suppress or help with that depression, which may have exhibited these symptoms of madness. But when I read later on her life in the sanatorium, I don't think she was mad at all. Probably very eccentric. So let's see if I can find that text about when she was uh, in her final years. So a bit sad. Here she's at the hospital. Um, and it says her mother cannot visit her often due to the cost of the train ride. The hospital is 150 miles north. By the 1950s, her parents are both deceased, and Audrey does not receive visitors anymore. Very, very sad. Further on it says, I am told that she was spending her time in the library and caring for the many cats that lived on the grounds. I am also told that she took great care of her appearance, making all kinds of remedies for her skin, including ingredients from milk to yogurt to urine. Audrey stays at the hospital despite the waves of patient downsizing and the tremendous changes that occurred in mental hygiene since the 1950s. She was a very modest, fine lady, I'm told. Okay, it says here that she had, she had a doll that she cared for a great deal. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing at this stage she was of a great age. But this is what I find very endearing. Listen to this. But once in a while she left the home to go on a little excursion on her own. She would cross the four-lane highway in front of the nursing home to reach the little strip mall and visit the local bar. At the bar she would have a couple of drinks, and I imagine conversations filled with her breathtaking memories. The caretakers at the nursing home had to go repeatedly to collect her. They would carry her back against her will, because she had been enjoying herself at the bar and did not want to leave. After a while, this behavior was not considered tolerable. A petite old lady in her 90s crossing a highway, having some drinks in a bar. They sent her back to the state hospital in Ogdensburg. But that's sad. That's very, very sad. That, uh, I mean, what have you got to lose at that age if you get hit by a car? Really, they should have just let her go to the bar and have a few drinks and tell her tales to the, the regulars. I, for one, if I had been a regular... Would have loved to have listened to her recount her tales. When I was in my 20s, there used to be an old guy. He would also wander down from the nursing home uh, and, and get quite drunk. And they'd have to come and retrieve him. Really, really great old guy. Uh, he never wanted to go back either. And I can't blame him. But good on, good on you, Audrey, for getting down there. And the last part I just want to share with you here about one of the male nurses who worked there. He recounts that sometime after her 100th birthday, when her health had declined, she had broken her hip and was forced to stay in bed at this point. He visited her in her room. Another nurse present suggested that Audrey sing her favourite nurse a Valentine song. Audrey, with no teeth and barely any hearing left, sang him a fine little melody. Oh my God. Oh well, Audrey, rest in peace. Maybe she's young and vital again, wherever she is now. Before I go... My dear friends, I'm going to share a blooper with you. There was one paragraph there that I had mighty problems with. I think you will enjoy my problems. On that note, I will say, take care, God bless, and bye-bye. Riding a seashell... Riding a seashell... <laughs> seashells, seashells on the seashore. Riding a seashell chariot pulled by three horse... No. Riding a seashell chariot. <laughs> can't do it now. Come on. Come on, get your act together. Riding a seashell chariot pulled by three horse seahorse hybrid keep. <laughs> no, please. <coughs> Start again. Lights, camera, action. Riding a seashell chariot pulled by three horse seahorse hybrid creatures called hippoc... Called Hippocacamp, called Hippocacampi. Sculpture, Attilia Piccarilli. <laughs> it just gets worse. Riding a seashell chariot pulled by three horse seahorse hybrid creatures called Hippocacampi. Sculptor, Attilio Piccarilli used metal from the sunken ship for parts of the memorial. <laughs>